Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our next PA Forum CSR Supporters Group. It's wonderful to see so many of you here today, and clearly a topic that we need to cover. And I'm very, very delighted to uh, delight uh, to welcome our wonderful speaker today, Lizzie Rendell, who is the inclusion partner for Galliford Try. So we're very grateful uh, for your time and gifting that to us today, Lizzie. Topic today is achieving effective and reasonable adjustments at work. And we would love to be able to get your feedback. So if you are online today, please pop those in the comments. If you're watching this recording back, we'd love to be able to hear from you. Lizzie, I can appreciate this is a huge space. And I could imagine that you've spent a lot of time within Galliford Try to be able to um, you know, make sure that everyone feels that they have the environment and the, the inclusion that they, you know, need at work and that everyone's in a happy workspace um, and to the very best, working to the very best of their ability. I know that we've had a lot of events over the last couple of weeks and particularly coming up where we need to make sure that we've been very mindful and thoughtful to making that experience the very best and possible experience it can be. So, Lizzie, it is an absolute joy to be able to welcome you today. So thank you so much for joining us. So tell us a little bit about you to start with. Thank you, Dan. Um, thanks for the uh, the joyful introduction. So um, and I'm going to kick off by saying we by no means have this sorted and solved um, very much a journey. So we do have a long way to go in GT as well. Um, but yeah, a bit about myself. So um, my role is inclusion partner in GT. So I work in our equity, diversity and inclusion team. And we can talk a bit about what those words mean in a minute. Um, but I'm guessing a lot of you will already be very familiar with those. Um, and yeah, I've only been in GT for about nine months now, but I've been in the construction industry for nine years, um, done a variety of roles, but always done um, some work with equity, diversity and inclusion as a bit of a side hustle for about seven years. Um, and then a role uh, a full time came up a few years ago. So um, moved into the EDI space, um, something that I'm particularly keen on in, in supporting, could really see the benefit from a business point of view in terms of actually the opportunity for for us all to achieve high performance, achieve our potential at work, but also from a personal point of view as well of just seeing, yeah, lots of people go through situations where they there has been barriers in the workplace and there has been things that have present, prevented them from being able to achieve their best. And that's partly what we're here to talk um, about today. So yeah, just really looking forward to it. Um, please do, I don't wanna talk at people for 30 minutes very much. Uh, that's not gonna be enjoyable for me, probably not enjoyable for everyone else as well. So um, yeah, Dan, that'd be great. Thank you for monitoring the chat. So please do questions, comments, um, and we'll probably get a bit of interaction going in the chat. And if people wanna come off mute, um, more than happy to, uh, to take questions that way as well. Um, that is amazing. Thank yeah. you, Lizzie. Um, I'm going to uh, just put myself on mute now. If you can share your slides with us, that would be brilliant. I will do. And just a, just a heads up, I don't usually use Zoom. So um, if I'm a bit fluffy around the edges, <laughs> just <laughs> give me a nudge. Um, and also just before I start as well. So I believe um, we so we have activated captions. So if you do want to add your own captions, I think there is just in the toolbar at the bottom, it says show captions with the little CC. So if you want to uh, read what I'm saying along with uh, when I'm talking, then that is the that is an option. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well as we go through. Um, can you see the presentation? Is that coming up? Cool. Thumbs up. Thanks, Dan. Um, cool. So very briefly, I've, I've talked about myself, but um, I'll talk a little bit about GT. So um, we are one of the UK's uh, leading contractors uh, in the construction space. So we do both buildings and infrastructure. Um, and our aim is really to enhance the built environment. So um, and that's yeah also through the kind of as well as the building and infrastructure. We also work in the kind of specialist services space as well. So it's things like facilities facilities management, um, fire protection, specialist security. So do quite a range of things. Um, and we're very much um, learning uh, <laughs> very quickly how regional we are. So I'm traveling up and down the country um, on a weekly basis at the moment. So yeah, I really do operate quite regionally as well. So we have a lot of offices um, and a lot of sites, hence not being you know completely solved there is so much work for us to do so i'm not presenting us by any means as we are one and done um we're also very much on the journey and we have a long way to go so um very much in the trenches with you 
Um, cool. So what we will talk about today, so um, a little bit about the why, and we'll talk about some key terms. Um, I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar already, but I always don't like to assume. We'll talk about office setup. Um, I know that's particularly um, a hot topic at the moment. So we'll talk about accessibility, um, but also broadly um, from an inclusion point of view as well. Then we'll then move on to events. So looking at face-to-face -face and online, I'm sure a lot of you are involved in terms of uh, organizing some of those and supporting and, and facilitating effective events. And then we'll talk about reasonable adjustments. So look at some examples and, and some application. Um, we've got time for Q&A at the end, but as I said, please do ask questions as we go through. So probably going to open up in the chat or if people want to come off mute. So just some core concepts. So um, what do you think of when I say the word diversity? So feel free to pop some stuff in the chat. And if Dan, if you are able to, oh, I can get that up as well. But yeah, yeah. No, 100%. So yeah. yeah so what do we mean by diversity? What does that, what does that uh, evoke in people? It will go crazy in a second, Lizzie. Watch this. Nice. <laughs> uh, thanks, Deb. So, difference within team members, background, experience, skills. Yeah, absolutely love that. Michelle, inclusion to everyone. Uh, Karen, diversity, everyone included, everyone has a voice. Thank you. Uh, Melanie, thank you. Diversity in age, gender. Yeah, some good characteristics coming in there. Fantastic. So, when we say uh, diversity, we're really referring to the difference or the variety in a group of people. So um, as Melanie said, age, gender, um, as Debs was referring to, so difference within team members, the background, the experiences and the skills. So we kind of really look at this as a little bit of the numbers game. And there is the, the kind of traditional, you might hear the term protected characteristics. So it's your kind of your race, gender, age, uh, sexuality, religion, belief, and a number of others. But also love Debs that you've also brought in there as well in terms of actually experience and skills that's really key inherent part of our diversity so what about the word inclusion what does that invoke in people what do people think inclusion refers to even being considered thanks Dan Fiona everyone yep yeah, great including people within decisions, accessibility, absolutely. So when we refer to inclusion, it's the cultural piece. So this is the environment that we have in the workplace. So um, absolutely, yeah, Nadine's given fantastic, uh, fantastic explanation there, ensuring that all individuals, regardless of background, identity, abilities, are welcomed, valued, given equal opportunity, this is better than mine, I should make this my presentation, um, uh, given equal opportunities to participate and thrive within a community or environment. So yeah, absolutely fantastic. So diversity is very much the people and then inclusion is very much the culture. Um, so that's, you know, the environment. So are people safe, respected, valued? Are their ideas, you know, are they able to express their ideas if they want to? And are those heard? And also, can they perform to their full potential? I just like to bring those up early on in the presentation, because just one of the things that we find um, doing this work is that often people will just Kind of we talk about diversity and inclusion as, as one thing, but actually they are two different topics and we need to have both in the workplace if we're able to achieve. If we just have diversity, but no one feels safe and respected and valued and able to contribute their ideas, then we're not going to get any of the benefits of having lots of different brains in the workplace. So it is really important that we have the cultural piece. Um, so what about the concept of equity or equality what does that mean to people pop some ideas in the chat and we'll have a look at those so equality and equity same opportunities thank you dan anyone else want to come in on equality and equity I think I, I had to I, I had to challenge I'm not not challenge but I would challenge myself really about what equity meant because mm -hmm. I always had it as equality but I've never heard of equity mm -hmm. absolutely before. and a, a lot of people are in that um 
are in that mindset as well um so yeah you're absolutely not alone there dan and i'd say the the kind of field of, of edi or dei or ind or whatever <laughs> you want to whatever acronym you want to use we kind of we are moving more towards the equity piece now so um let's dive into the chat and see what we've got so vicky everyone is treated equally regardless of ability sex or race thank you Equity is ensuring people are given what they need to feel equal. Thank you, Tiffany. Everyone treated fairly and equally. We've got equal or level playing fields. Uh, Paul coming in with everyone is treated equal. Yeah, so a lot around equal opportunities, um, fairness, being treated equally. And love that. Thank you, Karen. So equity, meaning not everyone's starting from the same place. So yeah, really, really love that. So I will talk about what is the difference. So as Dan said, we're kind of more used to talking about equality and that is everyone being treated equally. Um, and that is very much the kind of the legal space, but actually we're now starting to recognize, hmm, okay, actually equity is really, really important because not everyone starts from the same position. Um, and we need sometimes to take actions to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to reach an equal outcome. I will give a very simple example and very relevant to today. So thinking about disability access. So the fact that we have steps all around our built environment, not everyone can reach the equal outcome. So we, we ensure that we build in ramps and, and other disability accessible features, you know, power assisted doors to make sure that actually everyone can achieve the same outcome, everyone can enter a building, for example. So really simple example, um, and this comes into play a lot. So this equity piece is really, really important in the workplace now, because we're starting to move away from, oh, ever we give everyone the same and start recognising that everyone actually has different needs. So what I need in the workplace to be successful is not going to be the same as what Dan needs in order to deliver his potential. So it's all just really making sure that we're kind of we're, we're leveling the playing field by giving everyone um, what they need rather than giving everyone the same. Um, and we'll, we'll dive into this more as we kind of go through the presentation. And finally then, so accessibility. So accessibility is all about the design of products, devices, services, vehicles, or environments um, being usable by people with disabilities. So I think we're used to thinking about kind of environments, the built environment, but also products, your website, um, also all of those, you know, the services that you offer, are they accessible to everyone? So a little bit of background. So what do we mean when we say disability? So a disability is any condition that makes it more difficult for the person with that condition to do certain activities or interact with the world around them. So um, one fifth of the population has a disability. But actually, 23% of working age adults have a disability. So it's, it's really quite high when you think about the population that we have in the workplace. Um, 70 to 80% of disabilities are actually invisible. Um, and yeah, do kind of pop some things in the chat in terms of actually what, what classes as invisible disabilities? What, what things can you think of that might class as an invisible disability? And I'll come back to that. Um, and absolutely, disabilities may be cognitive, they may be developmental, intellectual, physical, sensory, or a combination of those factors. So lots of, uh, lots of different things. I'm just going to scroll down the chat. So absolutely got lots of, uh, lots of things coming through. So thank you, Nikki. So we've got HIV, things like mental health, diabetes, neurodiversity. Thanks, Adele, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and autoimmune conditions, thank you, Gemma. Yeah, Vicky Wilson, ADHD, dyslexia, absolutely. So yeah, loads of loads of things coming through, things like, um, yes, yeah, so we've spoken about the kind of the neurodiversity piece. So that is um, uh, around sensory processing. So your ADHD, your dyslexia, dyscalculia, um, autism, but then also you can have some more, yeah, like physical conditions. So uh, things like Crohn's, um, it, it again is gonna be likely to be, um, yeah, and fibroids, uh, PCA, polycystic ovaries, absolutely. So a lot of these things are invisible, but they can still impact people's um, ability to kind of do those everyday activities. So um, 
just to highlight, accessibility helps everyone, not just people with disabilities. And we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go through the presentation. But again, kind of going back to my really simple example, ramps so uh, or drop curves. So they not only impact people in a wheelchair, but also um, people with pushchairs, buggies, um, suitcases. So yeah, all of accessibility can really help a lot of people beyond um, those who could consider themselves disabled. Now, I can't talk about disability without referencing the social model of disability. So I think historically, um, we're used to thinking of disability more through the medical lens. So that's really identifying, oh, the problem is with the individual, it is their condition, it is their um, lack of ability or limited ability, um, and it focuses on what a person can't do. Um, and it sees the disability, the kind of the words that, 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 are, that are listed here, sees the disability as a tragedy, something to be prevented or cured or contained and pitied. Whereas the social model of disability really, really important to recognise that actually it is the world, it's the environment that makes people disabled. So the fact that we have steps everywhere, again, kind of going back to this very simple example and recognising that disability is far more than uh, people who use wheelchairs. Um, but yeah, going back to that very simple example, because we have steps everywhere, we have disabled a certain number of the population. So the issues are in society, the barriers are in society rather than with individuals. So um, what we want to focus on is removing and reducing those barriers. And that is the, that is the piece that we'll be talking about today. So why are we talking about this? So very quickly then, 54% um, of disabled people are employed and that compares to 82% of non-disabled people. So we've got quite a big gap in employment there between disabled and non-disabled. 28% of disabled people want to leave their current employer because they don't think they're treated well. So what we've got is people not necessarily feeling able to come into the workplace and a very big chunk of, of people that are in the workplace are also wanting to leave. So um, we can start to think about actually how, how these barriers are, are really racking up and also how it really impacts our, ourselves as, as businesses as well. And then one in eight people um, are waiting over a year to get the reasonable adjustments they need to work. So these uh, are adjustments that impact and uh, enhance people's ability to just do their job to the best of their ability and we've got one in eight people waiting over a year just to get those basic adjustments that they need to deliver to their full potential cool so now we're into the good bit and the juicy bit i'm going to dive straight into the office setup um so please do jump in on the chat or come in uh, come off mute um with questions and and thoughts about all of this um be great to hear your kind of your own experience as well i'm sure a lot of you have already got a lot of this stuff set up uh, and sorted and, and some of you may be on the journey so um the first thing is, it's just quite a simple one, really. It's just about thinking about desk setup. So I know a lot of organisations um, have moved to, to hot desking a number of years ago, or you may be kind of in transition. Um, it's really making sure that all of your workstations have the right equipment. So thinking from a ADHD point of view, for example, so it's an element of, of neurodiversity. So um, I I don't like the term ADHD in terms of what it what it means. Um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. We're talking about deficit and disorder in one particular thing. I know there's a big movement online of let's move away from that terminology, but for now it is that's what we're using. So so we'll go with it. So ADHD. Um, you know, having the right screen set up can be absolutely vital for someone to be able to come into work and focus. So I think often you might see, you know, you might have fixed desks and they might have screens on, but then you might have a whole bank of hot desks and actually they've got no screens on. And actually for people that are coming into an office occasionally might not necessarily have their screen set up. Also thinking about actually, if you do have a hot desking policy, not everyone that doesn't work for everyone. So some people, so if we're looking at more from an autistic side, requires that consistency and that predictability and not knowing where you're going to sit when you come into the office 
can be really, really impactful. Um, and also in this image as well. So we've got some lighting that's kind of a, a suite of lighting that's overhead. Um, so adjustable lighting. So um, particularly again, from the autistic perspective. So sensory sensitivity can be a really big thing. So um, we have a, a colleague here that's just said, I can't go into one of our regional offices because the light, it feels like the lights are absolutely blinding me in my eyes and so um, really making sure that lighting if possible is adjustable or you might have a particular bank where you can dim the lights or turn off the lights um, or you might have some more kind of localized lighting that is adjustable to to individuals um, again it's not always possible in, in every scenario but you know if you buy windows you do, do you have your blinds set up um, so just kind of thinking about your overall desk setup can be really important um, and, and one of the simplest steps that you can take. Again, with the desk setup, so sit stand options. So it can be really important to adjust the height of your desk. So again, if that is something if you're a wheelchair user, but also this really impacts, this impacts everyone. Absolutely. Like, isn't it sitting is the new smoking is what I think um, we've started to say. So the ability to, yeah, just raise your desk and stand and, and work for a while. Um, again, it really supports a variety um, of disabilities and conditions, but it really does support everyone quiet spaces so i know a lot of you are, are moving towards quiet rooms so i want to talk a little bit about the difference between a quiet room and something like an, uh, a well-being room or a contemplation room so a quiet room is a space where um, and you can call it different terms not precious about the terminology everyone calls it different things but what you want is um, if possible to have a quiet room which is a, a working room so it's a room that someone could book and it is distraction free. It is a is a kind of a noise free zone. Or you might even have um, in a previous employer, we actually had a, a, a quiet working room. So it was a room that was set up and there was a number of desks in there, but it was like a library environment. So you go in there and there's no conversation. You're not allowed to talk to anyone. And it is for people that wanted minimal noise. Um, so again, can be really, really important for autism and ADHD to have minimal noise, minimal distraction um, in order to just be able to focus and deliver your work to, to the best of your ability. And then the alternative is, I'm um, sorry, the, the other um, provision that it is good to make if possible is also something around a well-being room, a contemplation room, a prayer room. And you can, I know obviously we tend to kind of we're moving towards, oh, there's so many spaces that we need, but also you can think smartly in terms of actually how can you have a number of different uses or of some individual rooms. So you could have a well-being room, which is really important for people to just actually, I just need to take five minutes and be away from the open office and, and the kind of the buzz and just need to sit and chill or I need to take a private personal call or it can be about um, if you have people who are coming back from maternity leave or keeping in touch day and need to express milk, um, really important insulin injections. Um, so yeah, having a, a, a a fridge in there with labels for milk, um, having yeah a sink, but also um, it can be used as a prayer room as well, or you might have a, a, a separate prayer facility. Um, so really important that you've kind of got enough of that space. So this room is not a working room. It's very much for things other than working. Um, and you can you can have a variety of options. Again, thinking about your kind of everyday accessibility. So um, for those who do use wheelchairs, um, power assisted doors, um, thinking about, yeah, your kind of ac uh, access and egress of, of spaces. So do you have uh, kind of when, you, when you've got change of surfaces, how does that flow? Um, ensuring that you might have power assisted doors on your external doors, but then the internal ones, how heavy are they? Um, are they power assisted? Um, so there's there's lots of different things to consider in terms of the the, the wheelchair accessibility. Toilets. Um, so I know this is uh, something which comes up a lot at the moment. So really trying to move towards gender neutral toilets. And, and what does that mean? What does that look like? So um, something called Superloose, um, perfect solution. So you've got your, your, your toilet in there, you've got your sink in there, you've got your hand dryer. Um, so it's all a self-contained unit. Um, so you're still kind of maintaining 
kind of private spaces for everyone, but they are spaces for absolutely everyone to use. Um, or in the toilet front as well, depending on what area you're in, um, it can also be good to sometimes provide a squat toilet as well as a sit toilet. Um, so I know some in the Muslim community prefer this type of toilet um, or from certain cultural backgrounds as well. I know this is someone shared with me yesterday, um, years ago on a it was one of the sites we had um, in a particularly diverse area, there was they were finding a lot of toilet seats broken and they were like what's going on here and actually realized yeah it's because actually the the employees that we had preferred to use a squat toilet so actually installed the squat toilets um prevented the broken toilet seats and, and minimized the health and safety risk there as well so again that's kind of can be a localized option if um if necessary and relevant um and also the uh, the wudu facility so this is kind of it would go alongside your prayer room so you might have it in a prayer room or you might have it um in a in a washroom in a shower facility or in a toilet um so this is uh, for uh, muslims to perform wudu before they begin their prayer requirements so this is a requirement for and it's a foot wash um so yeah you can you can order these we've, we've had one installed in, in one of our offices uh recently so you can order them and there's kind of portable options and, and all sorts of different options there as well so if you don't have kind of direct plumbing you can also still install these to, to meet the requirement um so yeah really important again if this is going alongside your your prayer room um, but also in your your washroom facilities as well so i've whizzed through those and i have rattled on um just going to dive into the chat down is there anything that's coming through uh i think uh sarah's just uh said that um she's uh i'd love to have be able to have space i think space sometimes is a challenge particularly if you work in a building where it you can't uh adjust it easily particularly if it might be in a, a, an older building perhaps or if it's an, a, a shared some a lot of offices now are in kind of shared spaces as well mm -hmm. so sometimes it's that responsibility, isn't it, between is it the shared space provider that needs to be able to organise that? Or if they haven't organised that, do you organise that? Um, but uh, Sarah was just saying that how well equipped the universities are, particularly to support students with uh, those quiet and contemplation um, spaces that you were talking about as well. Absolutely. Yeah, space can, can be a real challenge. I think that's that's probably one of the biggest um blockers to, to a lot of this a lot of, you know a lot of times we are in yeah as you say a kind of you might be in a managed office or you've been in your office for a long time and you don't have the the facility to move um so yeah it can absolutely be a challenge and look we can't solve everything we can't just <laughs> miracle a space out of nowhere um depending on where you are obviously you can have some kind of additional spaces um the kind of obviously in construction we use border cabins a lot um so we're kind of very used to having some of those more um either temporary or those kind of flexible spaces but again that requires having things like car park space and and that is not always possible so thinking about you could potentially add some Thing onto the building but again that is it's not always possible um lovely we just had um jack has got a well-being room yoga mats a small library book selection okay. which is also used as a prayer room um and tracy in the middle of a refurb i've noticed you moved you've moved seats tracy i think unless you haven't got your background on today <laughs> um but we um she's normally got a lovely aston martin in the background but um we're in the middle of a, a refurb and uh that we have all the options that you just mentioned um so yeah it's been it's it's great thank you lizzie awesome that's great great to hear that tracy so i'm going to move on to online events so i know a lot of you will be involved in in organizing so um up front and ahead of time i would always ask is there any adjustments that people need to enable them to access the event well. Um, you can also give some examples if you want to, um, and that can look at things like font size can be really important. So if there's a visual impairment, but also, I mean, how many times you've been at an event and there's people squinting at the back of the room, me included. Um, so yeah, just font size is a, is a really simple one. Contrasting colors. So um, if you have text on a colored background, just thinking about that color contrast. Um, again, it can be for visual impairment, but also for dyslexia as well. You wanna have good, good color contrast. I know even our actual branding setup with the gray, and we actually are, are, um, are kind of 
branded font is also a grey. And whilst there is quite a good contrast, it's actually not the best reading if you have dyslexia. So it is something that we're working with at the moment in terms of actually how can we improve that? What are the kind of alternative options that we can provide? But there is checkers online if you want to check if you've got good or, or a, a reasonable level of, of colour contrast. Um, so do look those up. Um, reminding people that they can have live captions. So again, your Teams, your Zoom, you can add live captions to everyone, but not everyone knows that it's there. Really useful um, if, uh, yeah, if you are hard of hearing or deaf, or also if English is your second language, or also like me, and you're tired sometimes, and you need to read as well as listen in order to focus. So again, these things can help everyone. Providing people with lots of ways to ask questions. So I think we're really good at um, online events of, you know, you know, come off mute, you know, chip in if you've got a question. And again, with the face to face, you know, you've got those those big rooms. Um, not everyone actually, probably barely anyone. I'd say probably the majority is with the I don't feel comfortable to, to ask a question. So kind of boldly, um, either in a, an online forum where there's there's lots of people on the call or, or an online kind of face to face uh, situation. So providing lots of ways to ask questions. So obviously today we're looking at the chat function, but also, yeah, anonymous routes as well. If you are doing something like a business update, um, it can be really good to have people having the, the option to ask anonymously, you might start to get a lot more questions. Yes, you're probably going to have some more difficult questions, but that's about, you know, are your leaders and, and, and managers, if they feel kind of comfortable and they feel ready and prepared to, to answer some of those, then that can be really, really important. Thinking about recording and sharing afterwards. So like we're doing today, and I'd always think about actually, are you able to share with captions or with transcripts? So I'd say most um, webinar or, or kind of meeting facilities now have the option to share captions or transcripts or, or add them on afterwards. Um, so yeah, I would always look at trying to share um, transcripts and captions. That really helps with people who process information in different ways. Some people like to read alongside listening. Um, that can be really beneficial. And then alt text as well. So um, alt text or alternative text. If you are using images and presentations or you're sharing documents afterwards. So alt text is um, if you're using a screen reader. So if if someone has a, a visual impairment or are blind, they might use a screen reader. Um, and what it does is it narrates what is on the screen. So alt text, well, when it gets to an image, it will describe what's in the image. So you can add, and I can I can show us at the end as well, just how to do that. Um, but also if you are looking at, um, again, if you are sharing presentations, one thing I discovered recently, and it's good to know is that the, the the order, you can also set the, the reading order. And that is again for a screen reader. And what I found out is that actually when you're just creating your presentation and you're kind of whizzing through and adding stuff, the order that I think maybe the technology isn't as good as it needs to be yet, the order is sometimes a little bit off. So sometimes it would read the body before it reads the, the title text. So I just changed the order to make sure that it's reading properly. Um, so that obviously it, it kind of comes through and makes sense as it's intended. Most um, technology now, so your kind of your Microsoft packages, you know, your PowerPoints and, and your words, they've mostly got an accessibility checker. So you can find it in the toolbar and that will uh, oh, lovely. I added that. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so you can find that in the toolbar and it will just let you know. It gives you some tips. Um, it's not completely comprehensive, but it gives you a bit of a flavour for some things that you might want to consider. And then if you can. So finally, I just like to reference the diversity of speakers. And again, this might not be something that you can always influence. But um, if you are able to, I think it's really important to consider trying to have a, a bigger range of people from the diversity aspect speaking as uh, as much as possible. And again, we are all on our journeys with this in terms of organisations and recognising that it takes considerable time, certainly to shift some of those. Um, yeah, from from the leadership perspective, that is going to take time to, to kind of have diversity coming through. 
um, but also thinking about actually, is there ways that you can kind of shake up events? I know we've had um, in previous organizations brought in people, other people kind of from more from the grad cohort to reflect and to share their views and their and their thoughts and opinions. So um, it can be really good opportunity to kind of shake up the, the traditional way that we run events um, uh, from an online webinar business update perspective and just hear from uh, a broader range of people as possible. So moving on to conferences and face-to-face. -face. So again, asking if any adjustments um, that people need to be able to access the event. Um, and something that um, I nicked this from some event I went recently, they shared the floor plans ahead of time. And I was like, that is absolutely fantastic. Not only from an accessibility point of view, but be able to see, okay, yeah, absolutely. If I do need the accessible entrance, here it is. Um, but also I can see immediately we've got our gender neutral toilets in there. We've got where our accessible toilets are, where the cloak room is, where we'll be having tea. You know, if you've got something like a wellbeing room, you could highlight that on there. But even just like for me as an attendee, like it was just really, I felt comforted going to the event being like, okay, when I get there, I know where to put my coat and I'm probably going to want to go to the loo and then I'm going to get myself settled. It just made me feel really kind of relaxed going into a new space that I didn't know. So just a really simple but really nice um, trick that you can use. Disability access is standard and don't assume that everywhere is um, accessible because it absolutely isn't, um, which is really sad to say in, in 2024, but it's absolutely not the case. So I would really kind of double check that and also communicating any on the day changes. So things like a lift not working or um, yeah, certain elements of transport or if there's kind of route diversions on the way. So just communicating those because yeah, if a lift doesn't work, then that can mean that a building is just not accessible at all. So really, really important. Um, and if there are, you know, don't assume that every building has um, a portable ramp or a temporary ramp that they can use. Really make sure that that is, that is all um, arranged before you arrive. Again, thinking about your prayer facilities and multi-faith toilets. So um, I know we've certainly made errors in the past in terms of accidentally organising various events during Ramadan when people are fasting. Probably not the best idea. Um, so started to recognise actually we need to move away from, we need to recognise when there's certain events that are happening um, in religious or faith calendars and making sure that we are probably organizing events that are if they are going to take a lot of energy away from those times but also ensuring that we have the right facilities for our employees when they do need them again those gender neutral toilets and your quiet or well-being spaces if it is a really social active event a lot of people actually could really benefit from just having a quiet space to just come and and, and kind of digest and uh, and recuperate so that can be really important to, to have as an option um and then also considering inclusion of after event activities so um yeah how much kind of physical activity if you are doing things like team building or you might be having you might do your kind of your conference day and then be having drinks in the evening just be cautious and just be aware um so certain uh faith so things like um in islam some muslims will be prevented from drinking uh, sorry being in an environment where other people are drinking so just being aware that it's not just the individual consumption of alcohol it's also being in a space where there's other people consuming alcohol around them so just being mindful of that and, and being aware and and yeah, it's really about kind of knowing our employees and, and understanding actually, yeah, what what enables to get the best out of people, but what also would really exclude someone from being able to attend that team event. So I'm just going to pause there in terms of the online and the face to face. So any comments, questions, reflections in the chat? Um, so... Debs, love your love your uh, your little ploy there for conference as well. Just put it's great, Lizzie. We learned that sharing a PowerPoint live can provide automatically translated languages uh, via an input. I had to read this a couple of times, Deb, because <laughs> this is so techy. Um, via an inbuilt Microsoft um three six five AI, and which she learned at our learning and development event this year, which was great. Um. 
Really great checklist to consider, uh, Lizzie. Thank you. Meetings are just as important. Online meetings are just as important as in person. Mm -hmm. uh, love the idea about sharing the floor plan. I've got to say, um, the biggest feedback we've had at, uh, from our conference, and I've read every single form, is about the awareness of the spaces. And I spoke to you about this, Lizzie, beforehand, about people knowing if they don't want to be part of the big event, where could they go that's a little bit quieter? Um, uh, uh, where is the cloakroom? Where is this? The, yeah. the, we've got a 98% female populated um uh audience so obviously trying to go to the trying to go to the loo in the breaks mm -hmm. is quite interesting but i squeeze that into a 10 minute break yeah so <laughs> not always possible these, all of these things and vicky um shared and and i've got to say vicky thank you for that because i didn't know what a peep was a personal evacuation plan i think it is if, mm -hmm. forgive me if i'm getting this wrong um uh but it was made aware to me by one of our other members and uh, the venue have been fantastic to work with for our awards to be able to put those plans in place yeah. but I also just wanted to share Lizzie that um, we did a focus group before and um, I won't name who this person is but they were nominated for an award and they went to a venue in London but because they'd never met the organiser or they'd never met any of the judges or anyone on um, that lady was in a wheelchair and when she arrived in London she paid for the train she would got there she got a hotel she arrived at the venue it was totally inaccessible for a wheelchair um, and she also found out that the stage wasn't set up with a ramp on it which yeah. automatically in her mind thought well I'm not going to win because they haven't set the stage up for me yeah. with a ramp and I as soon as I heard that, I got on the phone to our AV company and I said, can we please make sure that there's a ramp at both of our events this year? Because that's really important. And I double checked with the venue, the entire accessibility and to go and walk the routes mm -hmm. myself and to make sure that there aren't any of those challenges. Because whilst we would always love to know everybody that's coming to our events, sometimes it's impossible to meet everybody. So it's really important to have that inclusion piece for sure. Absolutely. And yeah, thanks for highlighting that, Dan, because, yeah, if you are doing a particularly large event and it also might be something external as well, actually, you might not know everyone that's going to that event. So, yeah, really highlights the, the, the significance and the importance of setting the right standard. It's a kind of I talk about this as being it's in an individualized approach when we speak about equity that you need to know about your employees and what they need. But also, yeah setting the right standards means that actually everyone is able to achieve I can kind of share um, from our own experience of I work with a colleague who in a previous organization working completely fine um, no issues uh, and no real challenges actually moved to a new organization and has realized that they're probably neurodivergent probably ADHD as a result of the you know the office setup isn't necessarily right so actually having the right standards really means that everyone can can deliver to their full potential and actually means that yeah we, we're just removing some of those barriers but also being able to have those individualized approaches where necessary so this um really great questions come up from Claire because I think I've been thinking this as well as we've been going through your presentation this is about like you want to find out as much information as possible about people. Mm. Um, Claire works for a relatively small organisation is thinking about putting together a questionnaire perhaps to send out to people. I think the worry is I find sometimes is you always almost worry about if you send out, I, I, if you send out a questionnaire and you miss something, it then doesn't look as inclusive, mm -hmm. I guess, because you've, but sometimes I also think, also you where where do you where do you do you start so is it more about encouraging them to tell you or putting that questionnaire together yourself I guess I'd love to get your advice on that mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and yeah really really good good question Claire so one thing that I would always focus on first and foremost is what is the environment that you have and when I talk about environment I mean culture so um, employees are going to share stuff with you or feel comfortable to share stuff with you if they trust that it's going to be used for the right reason. So um, if you are, yeah, come from a, a, 
an organization or an industry that just has a really really toxic culture and you start asking these questions people are going to be very suspicious and they're not going to share the information so I'd first and foremost think about actually how are you carefully communicating with your employees you know in advance so you might want to have a bit more of a, a kind of rather than launching straight in with a survey you might want to think about okay well can we put on an event that starts that gives one of our leaders or our managers or someone that's kind of quite key in the office an opportunity to really communicate our values and the environment that we want to set and then you might do you know a few other bits before starting to say actually we 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 would like to know a bit more about you know what do you, what is it that you need to be able to reach your full potential and that's where you can start asking a few more questions so I would hesitate to kind of go in cold unless you you know you might already have all of that stuff sorted and and there is a very kind of inclusive culture and atmosphere but again just thinking about what you so one thing I hear quite a lot from um, a lot of our teams is oh our team's inclusive and what I'll always say is your team is inclusive for you that is your experience that's your individual experience so often we are accidentally just not aware of, of each other's experiences and, and how they're coming into the workplace because that just isn't our everyday. So I'd think more about the, the culture and the environment that you're setting up, trying to um, yeah set the tone, really have leaders being vocal and visible about inclusion is one of the biggest things that you can do that's going to encourage people to want to share some of those things and that's where you can start to do some questionnaires or you might want to do focus groups or yeah I think someone mentioned they're doing an office refurb great opportunity to be like hey we're, we're designing some new spaces what do you what do you want what do you need um so yeah hopefully that's hopefully that's helpful yeah I yeah. think that's uh, that's, I think that's great with all the, obviously there's there's some examples in the, uh, in the chat box, which you won't repeat, but um, it's it's great that people are sharing their, their personal experience, because again, I think we don't realise sometimes until it is brought to our attention or we walk in that person's shoes that we can really understand what it's like, you know, mm -hmm. for, for them to come to it. And it's exactly what you said about, you know, the, the drinks. I know that people are being a lot more mindful around about drinks and events now and companies are becoming a little bit more mindful with the budget. So for example, they might give people a budget for a Christmas party, but it's not to go to alcohol, it's to go for food, for example, or it could be, you know, one drink instead of it being like an absolute kind of, you know, mm -hmm. did get together, everyone's having a drink kind of thing. So I think that's, the, the, this has been incredibly useful Lizzie thank you so much for all this information it's brilliant no um yeah also just uh I think Vicky's experience of taking 15 years to get a um personal emergency evacuation plan in place I think just really says it all in terms of I think we like to think as a society we're better than we are and yeah sadly we're absolutely not and as I said lots of places aren't accessible so really really good to, to double check down your example of yeah there not being a ramp to the stage so that the speaker couldn't access like yeah absolutely like these things shouldn't be happening but but they absolutely are so um last few slides then so i want to talk a bit about reasonable adjustments so this may be something that you get involved with this might not be um but i think it's good to be aware of so reasonable adjustments are uh, um written into law they're written into the equality act which is the the piece of legislation that deals with all, all things equality um so a reasonable adjustment is a change that must be made to remove or reduce a person's disadvantage and that's associated with their disability when they're applying for or when they're performing a role so it can include lots of things so changes in the working environment changes in the conditions or recruitment arrangements um, and this is a legal requirement so workplaces are legally re required to provide them for people with disabilities um, and when we refer to um, disability just kind of in this uh, legal context so I think it's um, so it's physical and mental impairments that have a significant impact over the long term and when we say long term it's over 12 months or it can be a, a kind of a repeated uh, experience. 
So just want to share some examples because I think it just can be helpful to kind of to get us thinking. So I talk about um, reasonable adjustments from three lenses. So you can think about the way things are done. So that's sometimes our norms or our policies, the physical aspects that we've spoken quite a lot about, but also your additional equipment as well. So the way things are done. So um, timings. So you might be a shift pattern or it might just be the times that you're expected to turn up to work or someone's working pattern um, that can you can you can adjust that. So it might be um, you might have shifts and actually you might for some individuals, again, coming back to that kind of autism and that um, consistency and predictability, you might have a fixed shift for an individual who's autistic so that they can maintain that that sense of a uh, routine within their life um, or it might be you uh, from a mental health perspective enabling someone um, with uh, generalized anxiety disorder to not travel during peak times on public transport so adjusting that that time so that actually someone can get to work a bit of a quieter time and just mean that yeah they can come to work and are not at an elevated le level of, of poor mental health or stress um again we've, we've we've touched on this but thinking about the the actual setup itself so you might have a hot desking policy um for everyone but actually for some people this is your fixed desk or this is your fixed working space um to provide that kind of sense of routine or if someone has yeah physical elements of disability, they might have a different type of chair, a different type of screen set up, keyboard, mouse. So it's, yeah, thinking about it, some people might need a fixed space um, and that can be really important. Coming into the office, if you're someone with ADHD or autism and not knowing where you're going to sit, that can actually just really like ruin someone's whole day and just mean that you're not able to focus, feeling quite anxious coming into the space, not knowing you know, are you going to have to sit in the noisy, the noisy area or are you, you know, can you sit away from the window to reduce the glare and the, the light that impacts you so much? So all of those things can, can really come into play. Physical aspects. So we have spoken about lighting, um, but also some things like you can also have a, uh, a visual audio uh, yeah, audio visual fire alarm. So it's a fire alarm which has a red um, flashing light as well. So if you are deaf um, or if yeah you, you're missing certain elements of your, your pitch and your hearing or your hard of hearing, so having that visual fire alarm, especially if you have a kind of a low occupancy space or you have um, yeah people coming into work on different days and the office isn't always busy, having or you've got spaces where people are going to be lone working, this is really important, or yeah, it might be in the toilets if it's someone might be in there on their own, having that visual fire alarm can be really important. And then things like uh, additional equipment. So your noise cancelling headphones is a really classic one um, to uh, reduce the noise uh, distraction for ADHD. Um, and there's also lots of different technologies uh, in the form of, uh, I think it's classed as assistive technology. So um, things like Grammarly and Read and Write can be really great for dyslexia. Um, and also, yeah, I think there's things, there's a free software called Color Veil and that puts a, a, a you can choose a tint to put over your screen that can be really useful for um, dyslexic people to, it really enhances the kind of ability to, to absorb and, and comprehend written information. So lots of different software tools that are available to support people. Again, your kind of, your screen readers, your um, narrating uh, tools can be really, really beneficial. So I've just given a very light snapshot there that's by no means exhaustive um but just give, wanted to give you a flavor of some of the things that you can consider from a reasonable adjustment point of view so any any thoughts anything coming up in the chat happy to take any questions um so i think um tiffany made a really lovely point here she just but we have to also remember that it takes time for a person to feel comfortable enough to reveal their challenges and as a temp, it could be really challenging, mm -hmm. uh, particularly if you're moving from different organisations over a certain period of time. Um, I guess if there's a recruiter that's looking after you, then it's really that relationship with them that they should be really trying to make that that business aware of of those reasonable adjustments that you need I don't know I'm I'm kind of just what would you say Lizzie yeah absolutely and yeah thank you so much Tiffany this is a really really good point 
often people don't necessarily disclose a reasonable adjustment at interview or when they're coming into the workplace because you're not sure if it's going to be safe for you to talk about that you're not going to be you know how do you know if you've not been there long enough um if you are a new employer if you are a temp that actually you're going to be supported and you're not going to be it's not going to be used against you or it's not going to be detrimental in any way and that is sad but it also is absolutely reality as you've spoken about Tiffany I think um, a number of organizations if they do have people moving around roles or you know if you've got um, a grad scheme for example graduate scheme where people are moving between different departments to get lots of experience um, I know people have used accessibility passports so it just details you know these are my requirements and, and this is the kind of the, the setup that I need, this what enables me to deliver at my best, and it enables that to be kind of passed through line managers. I'm not aware in terms of if that might be an option as well for, for recruitment agencies. I'm not sure if that's a tool that they're using. Um, I'd really like to, to hope so and to think so. Um, but yeah, it, it might not be the case. But also, as you said, Tiffany, maybe that isn't something that you feel comfortable to disclose before you get there. Exactly. Yeah, that's great, Lizzie. Thank you. Um, so I think, Lizzie, it's been fantastic to have you with us. We are so grateful. Julie Bird, thank you so much for connecting us. Sarah James and Bethan and Monique, I'm so grateful uh, for you all bringing all this session together. Sorry I didn't have a chance to meet you before, Lizzie, but it's been absolutely brilliant to be able to, to welcome you. Our next session um, is on the 25th of September. Um, and we're going to be inviting Vanessa Hastings from Crafty Team Building, who's going to be doing an online practical session where we'll be doing some um, useful crafts, uh, craft making and taste at origami junk um, uh, junk mail session. I'm interested, Sarah. That's going to be that sounds really interesting. I don't I'll think come I've back for that one. That, that sounds great. Hold that very well. Have I, Sarah? Do you? <laughs> Yeah, so um, so Vanessa is very kindly gifting her time. So she does lots of different um, environmental and sustainability kind of workshops and team building. And basically, not that we want to collect our junk mail, but um, if you've got any pieces of junk mail um, that you want to bring along to that session on the 25th of September, she's going to talk us through um, things that we can um, make online uh, that might be like little um, pots or holders and things um, and just... Yeah, just a, a bit more of a, a practical session and um, just with that kind of twist on environmental and sustainability. Um, but yeah, I just um, want to say a massive thank you, um, Lizzie, for um, give, gifting your time today and a really useful session. It's wonderful to see lots of um, new faces and um, lots of existing people that have supported uh, the CSR supporters session. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you all so much. We really appreciate it. Lizzie, have a wonderful rest of the week and everybody else. Look forward to seeing you again at another event soon. Thank you all so, so much again. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.